Hey, do you want a holiday card from DTNS? Become a patron and give us your address by November 15th, and we'll send you a special DTNS holiday card. Coming up on DTNS, some companies that are actually building the blocks of the metaverse, a shipping company that might challenge Amazon's chokehold on two-day shipping, and why it's your brain's frame rate that makes time speed up as you get older. Time now for DTNS. <laughs> This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, November 4th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From Washington, D.C., I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. We were just talking on Good Day Internet why Justin is in Washington, D.C., why people in Washington, D.C. call him Ray, and how he now has a regular bar. If you want to get that story, uh, go to patreon.com slash DTNS. Where we should thank our top patrons like Mike McLaughlin, Miss Music Teacher, and James C. Smith. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Asus announced the VivoBook 13 Slate OLED, a 13.3 inch Windows tablet with a 1080p OLED screen, detachable keyboard, and magnetically attached Asus Pen 2.0. Runs on an Intel Pentium Silver N6000 CPU, shipping in December, starting at 600 bucks. Google is introducing a new set of search filters below the search bar, Google Drive. This will let you limit the search by file type, modification date, location, and more. Google Drive already has filters, but they were behind a submenu. You can sign up to beta test them or wait for them to come to you on all workspace users very soon. As expected, Nintendo revised its full-year Switch sales forecast to 24 million units, down 6% from previous forecasts. According to Nintendo President Shuntaro Furukawa, the company doesn't think it can fully meet expected demand during the holiday quarter because of the ongoing ship shortage, saying, quote, there is no sign of improvement and the situation continues to be severe, so I can't say how long it will continue. Electrek reports that Ford is selling its Illuminator electric crate motor to the public so people can build their own electric vehicles. The idea is to help people convert an existing internal combustion-powered car into an EV. Of course, that is not for everyone. You still need an inverter, battery pack, control system, and, you know, the knowledge of how to do the conversion. Still, for those who can get all of those and have the know-how, the engine is easy to get if you have... $3,900. Uh, two stories about tech in the air here. AT&T and Verizon have agreed to delay their December 5th rollout of 5G in the 3.7 and 4.2 gigahertz frequencies known as the C-band. Uh, that's below millimeter wave, but still gives you a little more speed than the lower wavelengths. The delay will let the companies work with the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration to address concerns over potential interference with some automated cockpit systems, like those that help planes land in poor weather. The frequencies are used in other countries, and the carriers dispute that there will be a problem, but you know what? They're going to play it safe and delay the launch. Meanwhile, the U.S. Federal Communications Commission approved Boeing's application for its V-band constellation satellite system designed to beam high-speed high broadband to U.S. consumers. The constellation will consist of 132 low-Earth orbiting satellites and another 15 non-geostationary satellites. All right, let's talk about cracks in the apps payment system, <laughs> Justin. Oh, uh, Tom, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> Two more cracks have appeared in efforts to lock people into using an app store's payment system. Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced that Facebook will soon let creators share custom links to let fans pay for subscriptions to exclusive content on Facebook. If a creator uses that link instead of Apple's in-app system, the creator will keep all of the money. Facebook has promised not to take a cut until at least 2023. And Facebook will pay creators a bonus of between $5 and 20 for every new subscriber they add, no matter how much they pay. Facebook believes this is already allowed under Apple's current terms because it's the creator, not the developer of the app, who's sending the customer to the web to pay. Meanwhile, Google announced changes to its in-app payments in the, pay in the Play Store in South Korea. Developers will be allowed to offer alternative payments options outside of the Play Store's own system. Developers will stay, uh, will, will pay a percentage of that transaction that is 4% less 
than they would pay if they use Google's own system. The Republic of Korea passed legislation in August that prohibits companies from requiring developers to use a platform's in-app payment system. Apple, on the other hand, continues to play their game of chicken. A text of the law says apps must not be forced to choose a specific payment method that has quote unquote unreasonable fees. Apple says its current system doesn't violate the new law. In other words, Apple thinks fees, at least the ones they're charging, are very reasonable. Mm. It's up to the Korea Communications Commission to open an investigation and potentially fine Apple if indeed they find that interpretation to be incorrect. Yeah. So a Apple's doing to Korea what Facebook is doing to Apple, which is like, I don't know, the way I read the rules, we're not in yeah. violation. Come at us if you disagree, right? Facebook's doing it to say like, no, it says the developers can't link, but it's not us, it's the creators that are linking out to the other payment system. Uh, actually, I, I think what Google's doing here is, is, is probably the model for where we're gonna end up in a lot of these situations, which yeah. is fine, you can use some alternative payment system, we're still gonna take a cut uh, we are going to acknowledge that we aren't running your payment system. So that cut's going to be smaller, but the cut we take is to defray the cost of running the app store. Uh, that seems perfectly reasonable. It's complex to implement it, but it seems like Google was able to do it. Whereas Apple's like, no, we don't want to implement that because if we implement yeah. it in Korea, we're going to have to implement it everywhere. And that's the key for Apple, right? Like this is another straw landing on an already strained camel's back. And at some <laughs> point it is going to break. I don't think it is here, although we'll see what happens with the Korean Communications uh, uh, Commission. On the Facebook issue though, I am very curious to see exactly how, I would love to be a fly on the wall in, in, within Facebook to know exactly how much Facebook really wants to stir this pot, considering the fact that they are not in love with Apple these days for what they have done to their ad tracking uh, uh, stuff. Because this is, I mean, granted, Facebook makes a clone of a lot of things. There are a lot of communities that exist, massive communities that exist on Facebook. Them getting into subscriptions is not something that is totally out of uh, uh, bounds for them. But making sure that they explore any possible interpretation of this rule, I, I do think is very interesting. Yeah. And and honestly, when we get the appeal in the Apple Epic case, when that runs its course, however many months and or years it takes, uh, not until that's all over are we going to understand where this is all going to land. Because Apple hopes it's going to win its appeal, right? So, so they don't want to change anything yet. Uh, Ars Technica has got benchmarks in on the Intel 12th Gen Alder Lake processors. And they're fast. They are, in fact, according to Ars Technica, and actually, according to Anantech and, and pretty much everybody else out there, faster than AMD's latest Zen 3 Ryzen's, which is surprising because AMD's Ryzen 9 5950X, their top of the line, is 16 performance cores and 32 threads, while Intel's i9 12900K, its top of the line, is 16 cores, but eight performance and eight efficiency cores. They're not all performance cores and only 24 threads by comparison. Usually the efficiency cores are seen as a great way to save battery life. You don't really need to save battery life in a desktop though. Ours found that Alder Lake beats Zen 3 in both Geekbench 5 and Cinebench R20 multi-thread benchmarks. Although they also found Intel uses a lot more power. Uh, still good power for the performance, power per performance, watt per, 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 you know, however you want to put that. But they use more power than AMD and they run hotter. So the thermal performance isn't as good. Ours ran the Intel benchmarks using Windows 11 and it ran the AMD ones using Windows 10. The reason they did that is because AMD has not been optimized for Windows 11 and Intel has. So ours expected Intel might win if they ran Windows 11 on both of them. So they were trying to balance the scale there. This seems to hold with other outlets too. The Verge notes that the 12900K beats AMD's 5950X in practically all of Eurogamer's tests, nearly all of Gamer Nexus's comprehensive benchmarks. And notably, the Verge's Tom Warren reportedly uh, saw no difference or barely any difference between Windows 10 and 11 on the top of the line Core i9-12900K. Warren's saying, I'm not sure they're getting that much out of that Windows 11 optimization, but it's still good, even under Windows 10. 
Uh, if you're as into the battle as you are into actually using the chips, the next move, of course, will be the expected AMD Ryzen 6000 processors coming early next year. Uh, the Ryzen 9 5950X, a little older. You know, the i9-12900K just came out. Roger, I know you follow this uh, super close. Uh, this seems to me like it's pretty good news for Intel. What do you make of it? It's definitely good for, for Intel. It's it's one of the big signposts that uh, Intel is making the transition away from a previous management era to the one under Gelsinger, where he is emphasizing, let's go back to what Intel was doing right before, which is make outstanding C uh, CPUs. What's really impressive, though, is that the top of the line Alder Lake is still $200 cheaper than the, the Ryzen 50, uh, 5950X, 50, and it still beat it. And so what that says to me is they understand there is now the value proposition that they have to play. Before it was, we had the fastest chip, we had the best performing, but you'll pay for it. Now they can say we have, you know, at, at most 10% better than, than the 5950X, but we're cheaper. And yeah. so this is a very unusual situation for people who have been following the AMD versus Intel uh, saga for like the past decade, where AMD has always been... Yeah, we're not the fastest, but we're we're the best value for the buck. We give you the best bang for the buck, and now Intel can rightfully claim uh, to say that as well. Yeah, Intel looked at AMD's lunch and said, "You know what? I think I'd like a bite of that 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 cheap performance uh, lunch that that you're having there." Which honestly, when Intel announced the prices, that would have been enough, as long as they weren't far behind Ryzen, as long as they were at parity. Uh, that would have been enough to say, "Wow, Intel's got uh, more affordable chips." The fact that they are not only more affordable, but also ahead in the benchmarks, is that's just a cherry on top, isn't it? It is. And it's, and you have to understand, the Alder Lake has PCIe 5 support, and it supports DDR, uh, DDR5, both newer newer component technologies that won't we won't see in AMD until they release six, uh, the 6000 next year. So if you want to future-proof, for example, you have not upgraded your machine in you know four to five years and you want to upgrade... You would honestly be looking at Intel because they have a more future-proof roadmap currently than AMD has with their com uh, current uh, comp uh, chips that they have on market. Would you expect the 6000 series from AMD uh, to nudge them back ahead at least? Uh, yes, I think AMD definitely does have uh, cards to play, but you know it is. I mean, the truth of the matter is, despite what what's better than than, than which. Uh, companies' chips are better than the other. Right now, supply supply constraints have pretty much made anyone very desperate for whatever high performance chips they are able to buy. I've seen people buy, you know, lesser chips because they can buy them comparatively over yeah. something that's much better, but totally unable to to purchase off the market. Yeah, I mean, we're not, none of us are able to buy any of these chips, but it yeah. sure is nice that, they, that they're winning the yeah. In that daydream scenario, yes, the yeah, Intel right. is definitely winning it. Uh, folks, if you got a thought about this or anything we talk about on the show, don't be shy. Email us. Uh, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Meta's Facebook says it's testing ways for Facebook group administrators to create subgroups and make money off subscriptions for exclusive content, shops, and fundraisers. That money part is central to Facebook diversifying future revenue away from ads, but Facebook Vice President of Communities Maria Smith told CNET that its group's strategy will be a central part of the metaverse. Now, Facebook, nay Meta, is pushing itself as the leader of developing the metaverse, but as we heard from Nate Langson earlier this week, the actual metaverse, whatever it ends up being, is likely to come from elsewhere, at least in part, if not most. So we're going to make an effort to point out non-meta and therefore non-Facebook stories that point the way toward a potential metaverse. One of these is the use of blockchain and NFTs in games, which is a step toward the kind of persistent virtual items often described as a fundamental part of a metaverse. Uh, lots of game companies are looking at NFTs and blockchain. Ubisoft mentioned this as central last week. EA is the latest, telling investors that they are an important part of the future of our industry. FIFA football collectibles obviously seem a first choice for EA. They're very popular. EA CEO Andrew Wilson told investors he thinks there's an opportunity to expand value through NFTs, but the company needs to, quote, make sure we continue to appropriately tune and balance the experience for our players. So he's sensitive to the idea. We don't want this to come up as you can buy your way to a win. 
Another example, though, outside of gaming is music. Hybe, which is the company that manages one of the biggest music groups in the world, BTS, announced plans to set up a joint venture with Korean crypto exchange Upbeat to issue NFTs. To start, they will issue NFT photo cards of band members that will trade on the Hybe-owned Weverse app. Uh, they're not the first to try this, though. JYP Entertainment set up an NFT platform in July. SM announced its plans for cryptocurrency in the blockchain back in 2019. I think, Justin, these are the corners of the Internet to look at if you want to see the cornerstones and foundations of a, a potential metaverse start to be laid, which is, in the, in the examples I'm giving you here, the kinds of items that you would be able to carry around because they're NFTs. Well, I think that you're hitting on a core element of value. Like the internet as a technology is what it is. The internet becomes a cultural force because it brings value. It brings speed. It brings video. It brings uh, the ability to interact with each other on a level that we had not seen so far. Where I think the metaverse conversations tend to be is uh, you know when when Facebook, who's literally rebranding their entire business, so they might. Uh, a tilt toward this, the the extent of their imagination in their demo video is basically just a meeting. You're just kind of into room, except one of your friends has altered their skin to be a robot. Like, uh, uh, and then maybe you can change the wallpaper of what the room looks like. Where I think it's kind of underwhelming, uh, aside from just the general idea of okay, you can you can interact with your friends a little bit easier. What you've pointed out here is money. What is a thing that you can do in the metaverse or in this future that we are going to define as the metaverse that you could not do before? NFTs are a, a, a part of that because the concept of digital goods being worthwhile is a sea change for many people. There's a reason why it's so kind of controversial and the idea of, well, why does a JPEG uh, valuable for, for those who want to be critical of it? Uh, in this new world where we are spending more time online, uh, uh, you're going to have to figure out not only what value it brings monetarily, which is what we're talking about here, but also what value it brings culturally. And that's why I think ultimately uh, you are looking at, at more of the Travis Knight or Travis Knight, uh, uh, Travis Scott concert in Fortnite uh, than you are looking at Mark Zuckerberg and his boring friends sharing pictures of your, uh, their dogs. Yeah, I, I I was looking at these stories today, and it started to remind me of pin trading at at conferences and 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 even at theme parks, uh, where where you get you get you try to collect all the pins, uh, and and if you you get three of the pins, uh, let's say you you've got you've got the pin for a FIFA star, or you you've got the pin of of Jimin with Rock Bison from BTS, uh, and and you're you're looking to trade with someone for the J Hope pin. Uh, these NFTs can be like pins, right? They, 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 you can go into the metaverse and you've yeah. got the NFT for the only one uh, of sugar doing the sugar dance. And uh, you're looking to, you're, you've got, you want to trade, you, you want to find someone so you can collect the whole set. Yeah. I think also with the video game stuff is we've, uh, I think we've hit probably an upper level. Uh, uh, we, we are no longer elastic when it comes to video game pricing, especially as physical packaging and distri and distribution has kind of gone the way of the dodo. And so the more that these companies can figure out ways that they can get more revenue in because charging more for the game is something that has kind of hit a wall, they're going to explore it. Obviously, microtransactions have been controversial in video games, but that's where they've seen the growth. NFTs certainly more of a part of it. And if you really want to commemorate that time that you did that thing or uh, there are, are, are ways that uh, uh, you want to remember having a fond a moment in, in the game, then I, I do think that, especially at scale, those those could be worthwhile both to the consumer and to the company. Yeah. You don't need permission to dance, but you do need permission to get my NFT of Jungkook and his dog. Indeed. Tom, every company has an opinion on this chip shortage. Lenovo says it will continue into the first half of next year. Qualcomm says it thinks its shortage will begin to ease by the end of this year. And Intel's Pat Gelsinger is the gloomiest, saying this thing is not going to end this year, not going to end next year. No, those first rays of sunshine are going to come out in 23. While much of the chip shortage comes from a flood of orders causing a backlog, some of it also comes from shipping and logistics issues. 
And none of these statements will help you get your product faster uh, if it's delayed. Enter Danish shipping, uh, shipping company Maersk. Anyone who's lived anywhere near a port has seen the ships, cranes, and containers with the Maersk name on them. You might also catch them on a train rolling by as uh, you are sitting in traffic. The company moves 20% of the world's ocean freight, and Maersk just happens to have recently bought Visible, a logistics company with nine U.S. commerce fulfillment centers that pack orders for retailers. Controlling all of that makes Maersk believe it can fill an order and get to the doorstep of any consumer in the U.S., or at least 95% of them, in two days. Sound familiar? Maersk is squarely taking on Amazon. The idea to offer uh, businesses who sell from their own platforms the ability to match Amazon's shipping speed. Businesses can maintain control of packaging and branding on their stuff uh, so it uh, doesn't even have to arrive in an Amazon box. Everyone's investing in this right now. Walmart is expanding local fulfillment centers. Target is spending $4 billion to build out commerce. And even American Eagle, the clothing store company, just bought Quiet Logistics on Tuesday to get into commerce fulfillment. But all of these companies compete with the companies that would use their platform. Maersk does not. And Maersk has something that the other companies don't have, 700 ships and 76 port terminals. Yeah, this uh, this is the market solution to, gosh, I want to get things to my customers, but I have to do it on Amazon and they might steal my idea for a product and I don't control the branding. Uh, Maersk is looking at this saying, well, crap. Uh, we, we have the hard part of this, you know, the ships and the containers, uh, under control. Let's buy a logistics company, which visible I've, I've covered them for years. Not a bad one. Uh, that's, you know, pretty close to being able to do what Amazon does. And suddenly visible plus Maersk equals your white label shipping version. I've been believing that Amazon is going to do more of this sort of thing, where they're like, yeah, you don't have to sell it on Amazon, but we'll provide the logistics. And it feels like Maersk is trying to get there before them, uh, you know, and say like, hey, we've already got 700 ships. You don't have to wait around for us to keep acquiring our fleet. Uh, we are here today. You can offer two-day shipping from your website with your branding. We'll print boxes with your name on them. You don't have to use anybody else's platform and give them a cut. We'll take a smaller cut because we're just in it for the shipping. We're used to low margins. Yeah, uh, uh, a few things. Number one, Amazon is a logistics company. If you are in any way familiar with how and why they have been successful, yes, they do e-commerce. Yes, they are great at uh, getting your credit card. So you have a file or you have it on file. They make that process a lot easier. They're better at getting you to buy or, or better results. So you're buying something that you feel comfortable with buying. But the reason why they've succeeded to the level that they have is because they learned very early on, you need to have the, the product closer to the person that is buying it. And that means decentralizing all of your, your, your warehousing and making this an easier product so it gets there as fast as possible. They are uh, very good at low margins. What's been fascinating up until now, and really COVID and the lockdowns kind of sped this up like they did so much, is that getting to Amazon level felt like a daunting thing. And for a lot of these companies, many of which had physical retail locations, uh, the idea of, well, I mean, we don't want to go full Amazon. We don't want to build, you know, all these things. You had your your logistics companies for that. Now the, the issues are a lot more imperative. The lockdown showed that uh, online purchasing is just going to be uh, uh, here to stay. And if you want to play in that game, you're going to have to do it. The question that I would have for you, Tom, is Amazon already one step ahead of them? Because let's say that they do get as good at, at two-day shipping. Amazon's already built effectively their own shipping company that now does more uh, 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 package deliveries than FedEx. So like, like they've already done the next thing that you would do, which is build a post office. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Visible has very good relationships with FedEx, DHL, you know, all the shipping companies that exist, uh, but they don't control it. So yeah. that is an advantage that that Amazon can have. Amazon also still works with UPS and FedEx and all sure. those too. Uh, it reminds me of Netflix saying, we want to become HBO before HBO becomes us. Uh, yes. Maersk, Maersk is jumping into this going like, we want to become Amazon 
before Amazon becomes us. Because what Maersk is going to have to do is work from the big back end, from what I can tell, like, uh, you know, the sort of the, the backhaul of shipping to the last mile. And that's what Visible helps them do. But obviously, they still have to rely on FedEx, UPS, et cetera, for the, for the, for the very last mile. They want to become really good at that before Amazon gets ships and ports, uh, which they're yeah. starting to do. Amazon's moving into ports yeah. and doing operations in ports. Uh, and so it's a race to see, like, well, Maersk thinks we've done the harder part. I think we can get to that last mile and compete. And the answer is both of them will get there. Uh, and then we'll see what kind of competition we get out of that, which is good, I think. Well, yeah, it just gives more options to small businesses and, and yeah. to, to e-commerce businesses that, uh, you know, I do think we'll eventually see Amazon go white label for some of this stuff. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And whether businesses know, so. will trust them, given, you know, Amazon might have a perfectly legitimate, wonderful white label business and businesses, if they have a choice, may go like, yeah, but I read in the papers that you screw small businesses. So I'm going with Maersk. Sorry. Yeah. It'll be interesting. All right, folks. There, there's a uh, there's a perception out there that time passes faster as you get older, uh, and uh, I, I think everybody understands that a little bit, even into your 20s, certainly into your 30s, 40s, and beyond. Uh, that it just seems like the time flies by, and you wonder, like, is that a real thing, or do I just think that? Well, Harvard's Science in the News blog notes of a paper published in Cambridge University Press's European Review by Duke University professor Adrian Bajan uh, called Why the Day Seems Shorter as We Get Older. Bajan hypo hypothesizes it has to do with the physics of neural signal processing, the old brain processor. Hang in there, though. I think this is going to make sense. Here are a few things we already know. As we get older, the size and complexity of the neurons in our brain grows. We get more complex neural pathways. That means electrical signals have to travel longer to get places in the brain. Not your brain gets bigger, but there's just more pathways. It takes longer. It's, it's like a city, right? You know, it's, it's only a mile, but it takes 10 minutes to get there because of all the traffic. That slows down how fast we process visual information. He notes that nerves accumulate damage as we age as well, which acts as a resistance against electrical signals. Even if they get a shorter pathway, there might be cruft on there. There might be stuff slowing down the transmission. So Bajan argues that this means the more time that passes between each mental image uh, as we get older, and it takes longer for those electrical signals to go, we perceive fewer frames per second. When we're young, each second is packed with mental images. We're kind of like a slow motion camera, capturing at 240 frames per second, and it makes time feel like it's moving slower. Uh, but as we get old, you know, we're down to 40 or 20 frames per second. World looks a little jittery, but we smooth it out. It just takes more time, right? It, 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 we're not getting as much information per second. This is one of the many hypotheses out there, of course. Uh, it's a well-reasoned one, but it needs to be tested experimentally. Uh, Justin, this one makes perfect sense to me, which is like, it's not the time speeding up. It's that we're thinking about less stuff per second. And so we feel like, oh, man, what I, I had a thought and it, it took me a minute instead of two seconds. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think to me, it, it's it's the counter that proves it in my head or makes me believe it in my head. Not that I feel like things are going faster now, but I do remember the summer between fourth and fifth grade lasting somewhere between seven years and eight years. Like right. uh, uh, it, it felt like, or those school years felt forever that they just would not end. You would think that it was interminable and you look up at the calendar and it was still August. Like, uh, uh, so that to me rings a lot more. I don't think that there's anything, any situation I've been in in my adult life that has ever felt as long as a school year did. Yeah. Well, it, and that that's what, that's how you notice it, right? It's not that any particular moment feels like it's going faster at the time. It's that, oh my gosh, it's October already? I feel like it was just January. Or, oh my gosh, we're at the mailbag already? I feel like we just started DTNS. Uh, Justin, a different Justin, writes in, didn't know if this was DTNS or Cord Killers news, but he pointed us to a story on PC Gamer uh, about a woman named Lydia Ellery who signed up for Twitch and Instagram and a bunch of other places in 2010, 11 years ago, with the name Squid Game. 
Uh, apparently Squid was her nickname, and since she was doing gaming content, she picked Squid Game. And of course, now people are angry at her, thinking she stole the account of the Netflix show. She's had to reset her password. She says she's lost a couple of gigs because companies are like, yeah, that we don't like the confusion that, that people might have. They might think you're part of the Netflix show. Uh, so she's considering changing the username that she's had for 11 years. Justin, should she just hang on? Yeah, just give it another two months and uh, there's going to be a documentary about a clown who, you know, flew to space that we didn't know about in 1981 that everybody's going to love. And, and everyone will talk about that. And Space Clown will have to change his name on Twitch. So uh, I think, calmate. Like we are, everything is going to work out. If she has a brand and she's already getting gigs, yes, that sucks. It sucks to be in, in a situation where you could have a brand activation. You could be, be catching a, a check to do something. And because of entanglements, people are like, oh, okay, well, I, I don't want to be confused with a Netflix property. On the other hand, I would bet that there are probably some brand activations that wouldn't mind getting the Squid Game rub without paying Squid Game prices. I don't know exactly how much of an opportunity that you have for that kind of, of, of stuff. So my guess is that it probably cuts both ways. And I don't mm. blame her using this moment in time to engage her audience uh, uh, in, in a, an element of personal drama. But I think you're going to be just fine if you just just head to the Winchester and wait for this to all blow over. Hang in there, Squid Game. We're, we're, we're with you. Uh, no new bosses today. No, no new, uh, no new patrons. So if you, if you want to get your name on the show tomorrow, uh, get in there and support us. Patreon.com slash DTNS. But we do want to give a special thanks to the folks who've been supporting us for a long time at a high level. Vince Power, one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Thank you, Vince, uh, for all your years of support. We appreciate it. And thank you, Justin Robert Young, uh, for being with us. Uh, real quickly, before we get out of here, what you got going on? Well, if you want to know more um, and more about the Election Day results that happened on Tuesday, I'm here for you, not only with uh, some breakdown of the, uh, the night of, but also in tomorrow's episode, I have not one, not two, but three lessons that everybody needs to learn about what happened on Tuesday and specifically how they're going to need to react to them going forward for the 2022 midterms. Politics, 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 where all podcasts are found. I'm just saying, I was not surprised by the Virginia election results because I listened to PX3. I was like, oh, that's yeah. one of the things Justin said might happen. There it is. Good, good take week for me. Good. I'm feeling Absolutely. very, very good about my, 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 my takes for, for the for election day. <laughs> Folks, we are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 20.30 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Patrick Norton from AVXL. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>